I have the proud privilege of inviting our chief guest for today, caretaker, former caretaker Prime Minister His Excellency Envarul Kakar to come and speak to you. I also had the privilege of doing an event with him at Davos when he had he was a guest of the Pakistan Pavilion with the Chief Minister of Balochistan, Jam Kamal Sab. We had held an exclusive uh, event for investment in Balochistan at the Pakistan Pavilion. That is the kind of work that uh, Pathfinder Group does at Davos. And I'm also very grateful to Kakir Sab for always saying yes and coming to my shows. Thank you, Kakir Sab. I won't go for the long introduction and naming people, uh, but not mentioning Ikram Segal Saab would be a disservice to the whole idea of this community of World Economic Forum here in Pakistan. Uh, sir, thank you. Thank you uh, for having a, quite a long association with me. I was introduced to Segal Saab when I was the spokesperson of Balochistan government. And he happens to be there in Quetta. I, I recall uh, there's a small annexe in the outskirts of Quetta. It's called Hanna Uruk annexe. And we were having interaction with the chief minister, then chief minister. And from there, we just clicked. And we connected and uh, he ushered me, not just to World Economic Forum, but uh, he also inspired us to be the storyteller for Pakistan. Uh, what a wonderful storyteller we have uh, in his person. And uh, I realized when I first, uh, Dr. Homa rightly recalled when we were there with the then Chief Minister Jam Kamal at Davos. That was my first experience and exposure to the forum. <clears throat> and, and it just stimulated me and... and I remember that I was badly missing that global link with the parochial arrangement here in the country when I first uh, was exposed to Davos. Uh, Ikram Saab, uh, not just uh, encouraging the entrepreneurs here in this country and, and, and creating partnership at a national and global level, is also a person who's quite focused on opinion making. And he realizes uh, that other than the material infrastructure, it is the mental infrastructure which is so important in any society. How do you create your mental edifice? How do you shape up your mental inclinations, your penchant, your preferences? for cultural issues, for social issues, for economic issues, for political issues, and how does it impact the larger society? It's too important to be ignored. And he's the man who takes on that front and becomes a, a someone who generates a national narrative. It's a very, very daunting and challenging task. And I've always taken inspiration from him, learned from him. And another inspiring man is Ambassador President uh, Masood, whom I've been honored that I've worked with him. Again, my introduction to him was when I was the spokesperson of Balochistan government and he visited Quetta. At that time, he was the president of Azad Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, uh, equally, uh, have served this country, I have served the people of this country. Dr. Homa, it has been always an honor to be on your show, and we will continue engaging with that. But today, uh, when Ikram Sahib asked me to come and, and speak on this occasion, I was just thinking what, what to say. I'm someone who never uh, believes in structured and framework of talks. I uh, prefer to have an honest conversation rather than a clever one. Because in honest conversation, sometimes you reach to the right conclusion. In clever conversation, you just uh, make things more elusive and at times even delusional. Uh, what I, I, I learned 
in this small stint of few months, what is the role of the government? One thing which is for sure and, and I'm quite certain about is that the government has no business to do business. Lies are fair, argument I have bought and I'm religiously advocating that on all the forums. Even if we uh, take the Chinese so-called modernization phase, what they call Chinese modernization, and it is indeed. Uh, what they did was they crafted, they planned, uh, when post-1979, they engaged with the global rules, either signing with WTO and the rest of the international institutions, having access to the Western markets, and encouraging the Chinese private sector through the state patronage. So it was the private sector who brought in this transformation, who brought the Chinese dragon to be the second largest economy of the world. It was not the Chinese government on its own. So what is the lesson for us? If we want to go for the economic growth, if that is the goalpost, can uh, government run schools or hospitals or go for all these huge infrastructure and state-owned entities? Well, many governments have tried, from North Africa to Middle East, from Asia to South America, and most of them, if not all of them, have become weak states have become the states whose service delivery indicators are quite poor. And the countries which has uh, brought in this slice of air argument, and they have implemented that, their service delivery indicators are far, far better. I'm, I'm quite happy that uh, I know we, we live in a very polarized and divisive environment. Uh, but I foresee I'm, I'm inherently sanguine, I'm quite an optimist man. I think so we are in the cusp and we are aware ha having a transition, societal transition. The Western Hemisphere for last 5,000 years of its documented history, uh, where it initiated its first glory with the introduction of the Caesar, uh, the Rome has settled with individualistic society. But we are still here in the worship of our idols and our Caesars. And uh, this societal transformation which has occurred over there, we are a bit slow. We are slow, but that is a natural flow. Until and unless these 8 billion people on this planet, they are not equally treated, as Fassel was mentioning, uh, in the role of citizenry. Uh, not equal in uh, Rousseau's sense, equitable. Equitable in that sense that every individual, at least in terms of rights, is considered equal, and in terms of responsibility can be assigned whatever his capabilities or her capabilities are. And that transformation of the society, that egalitarian existence, either uh, with the difference of culture, religion, race, language, it's a quite a challenging task. It's quite a challenging task. Is it for me to fulfill that? Is it for PTI to fulfill that? Or is it for PPP to fulfill that, PMLN or JUI? I think so we need to move way beyond that. Every one of us has to think of himself or herself as an important contributor who can inspire and play the role of leadership. And that leadership can be here in the kitchen of Marriott. That leadership, who's Gordon Ramsay? A chef a global icon. How do we treat 
cooks and chefs with disparage attitude. What we need is to change this attitude. We cannot assign regality to the individuals or the professions. We have to assign regality to any human being who's born. The right of birth is regal. And that regality can be converted into the, uh, a sort of a modest vivendi where you do agree on the basic rules of engagement, societal engagement. I'm not talking about politics at the moment. And Pakistan, Pakistan is such a beautiful country. Uh, I always think that uh, what is our collective memory? Our collective memory, we are a blend of many millennia of, of historical experiences. When Alexander saw opportunity uh, that he has to move towards east, as there was no culture, no city, no wealth, he could have easily from Macedonia uh, gone around the Mediterranean and could have conquered or, or occupied any of the western territories, but he didn't. Because there was no incentive over there. The incentive was all there in Persia. The incentive was all there in East. Between Sir Darya and Amu Darya, the nomads of, of Turkic lands. And India, South Asia. So he had it towards this rich place. And he had it not just having a conquest, but leaving deep impressions. There are still Pashtun tribes in, in Khyber Pukhtunkhwa who trace their origin to the Alexander's advent. Uh, sometime the Afridi uh, claimed this, sometime other tribes, and even the physical appearances of Pashtuns are even contributed to the Greek uh, presence here in this region. Uh, then, uh, it's Arabs, then uh, the European colonizers, they came, all of them. What they did, I know it is not politically correct to, to rationalize colonization, but colonization has its own uh, uh, contributions too, let's, let's be honest about it. Pakistan and India was colonized, so we have a... Uh, rail infrastructure, we have a road infrastructure, we all speak in English language. Many African colonies speak in French, some speak in Dutch. So they bring in culture, language, the material advancement, and then they have to leave. Any colonizer cannot be there for, for eternity, for they cannot have a perpetual presence. But they leave behind what they bring in along with them. And the nations who, who are quite uh, ingenuous, uh, they, instead of having a negative emotional dwelling towards their colonizer, they just take advantage of that and they try to create a healthy relationship uh, later on. That's probably what has happened in the case of Pakistan also. A combination of Sanskrit, Persian, Arabic, English, and all the local languages. It brings us poetry. It brings us prose. It brings us short stories. It brings us history. Unfortunately, it has not transformed us towards science. Here we were halted. If we would have uh, uh, translated this knowledge base for last, I'm talking about six, seven hundred years, particularly of the Arab expansionism towards Spain and the rest of the areas, uh, it, it got halted there and it triggered reformation, it triggered and encouraged the House of Medici's in Florence uh, of Italian reformation and, and Renaissance, but it halted itself. And that stumbling block uh, had an implication for the rest of the region too, of which we were part. 
that's where is the missing link. That's where the divide between this East and West has gone in a sharp contrast. And it is just a story of a couple of hundred years, three, four, five hundred years, that's it. But we do have a sense which is quite entrenched in its past, in its identity. And what is that identity? It's not based just on faith. I think so it's so diversified. It is so versatile that it can pick and choose at any time and craft itself and shape itself and come up as a presenter, as a storyteller, and create a local audience, a regional audience, and a global audience. If Indians can claim uh, that they should be part of OIC on the basis of a sizable Muslim population, why don't we take credit for Mahabharat and Sanskrit on the basis of our Hindu population? I hail from Balochistan and Balochistan has one of the most important uh, temple, Hindu temple, Hinglaj Mata. Hinglaj Mata carries the value of Kaaba in Hindu mythology. But unfortunately we don't explore ourselves when it comes to uh, the stupas of, of Buddhism. They lie over here. It's part of my identity. Yes, I'm a proud Muslim. I am not apologetic about that at all. It creates the larger uh, Middle Eastern, North African fraternity for me. But I'm not radical. I apply the tool of religion to internalize it and grow spiritually which helps me in the light of that ayah which says from darkness to light. It hits my internal blind spots. I think so the, the, the biggest and the first and the earliest Democrat was God himself. When he narrates the story uh, when uh, Saturn defies to bow uh, on his new creation of Adam, he just does not condemn him. There's a due process. And he inquires from him that what made you choose this decision when you defied. So there's a conversation. There's a due process. And he gives arguments, whatever the arguments, the merit of the arguments are, but there is a whole process in that story, and I, I do seek that uh, lessons from that. Pakistan, a country of 240 million people, as I even said it when I was at Davos, it is lying on the one hand with the 1.5 billion Chinese in our backyard. It's uh, the Central Asia, North Caucasus, along with the Asia Minor, Turkey. ECO's country comprises of almost 500 million people. And then uh, a close strategic GCC, which is uh, sitting on the trillions of dollars of investment bonds. So this regional milieu, this environment, creates a lot of opportunities. It, all we need is to believe in ourselves. The only people whom I have seen uh, who are despondent about Pakistan is a couple of Pakistanis. I've never ever seen anyone outside Pakistan who's not interested in the future of Pakistan and who is not optimist about the future of Pakistan. I had a chance to meet uh, more or less all the global leadership in, the, in and around. And everyone takes 
keen interest. Everyone takes Pakistan quite seriously. When I, I was in Davos this time, I never had this idea that Mr. Schwab is uh, arranging uh, this event for the last 50 years. And I was clueless, I'll be completely honest about this intervention of the Igwells. And my, this one small experience of having three interventions at the Igwell, thanks to you, if I was not introduced to uh, a World Economic Forum, probably I would not have never had the chance even being a head of the government, was the most important and precious takeaway home from my stint. And what was there, and as, as Fasil was mentioning, this year's theme is education, uh, the equal informal gathering of world economic leaders. I'm a very, uh, a person who has, who has started uh, from a very humble background. My father and grandfather is neither a Daltana or a Bhutto or a, a Khan or a Fridis or Buktis or Murrays. I identify with a common Pakistani, I'm just Anwar. I lost my mother at a very early stage when I was four. I I was raised by my maternal aunt in a relatively quite constrained economic situation. We were not poor, but uh, uh, I could mildly put it that we were having quite challenges. Uh, the meal was available there. I could attend thanks to my late father who used to support our education, me and my sister. Uh, but we were never privileged children who had access to anything and everything. I have struggled in my life. I struggled in my life. I know there are people who hate me and there are few people who like me. But I've been someone who has always had his own positions. You may call me maverick, you may call me objective, independence uh, of mind, but it, it all depends on your personal inclination. But I have been what I am. I've taken positions in my life. I've always been opinionated. I've believed in my opinions. I've expressed my opinions. I've done advocacy for my opinions. I have never shied away from them. I've always internalized whatever I've believed in. I might have believed in wrong things. I might have believed in few things which if mentors like Masood Saab or Ikram Saab would have been there, probably I would have changed. I, I, I'm quite open to that. But I'm a consistent person. And I value consistency, not rigidity. And there's a lot of difference between the two. So, why I am sharing and bringing this uh, personal story? The reason is individualism. The society is transforming towards individualism, whether we like it or we don't. The political cults, the religious cults, the cultural cults, it's going to decline. They might appear quite powerful at the time. They might appear invincible at the time. But it reminds me another beautiful ayat of Quran. Kullu man faan. Everything has to perish. We come, we dwell, we perish. We are not eternal. That is one of the the weakest link of human existence. Our entire attempt, struggle, is to be God. We want to be eternal. We want to be perpetual. And that's where we fail. The natural answer to this 
challenge of human existence is individualism. Who does not seek perpetuality. Who enjoy, entertain and contribute in the allotted time. We all are here with an allotted time slot. Anyone who got that sense and took the best out of that allotted time, in my humble opinion, is the successful individual, is the eternal individual, is the one who would leave deep impressions even uh, way beyond. The people who have been remembered uh, by the history, uh, I, I feel that there is a commonality that they have been very focused in their allocated time slot. They have not thought way beyond about the history, that how they would be remembered. It is us who judge them in, in uh, the post events and even create stories and myths that that's how they would view it. I don't think so any successful individual has the luxury of spending time on thinking that how he would look after 1,000 years or 2,000 years. It's in that allocated time uh, that he takes advantages and disadvantages, whatever is available to him. Pakistan is a story of Indus. Pakistan has a beautiful geography. Pakistan has beautiful people, physically, mentally. It's, it's a country uh, where you hear the expressions from Baba Bulle Shah to Shah Latif, to Rahman, to Khushal Khan, to Jam Durrak. I mean, whenever I, I start thinking about a situation or, or a problem, uh, I'm fortunate that I am a bit, uh, I won't say well versed, but I'm, I'm quite exposed to Persian ghazal and poetry as well. So, so many answers I seek from these four and five poetic languages, which becomes and acquires the status of a mentor, they become advisors. They, they, they are quite suggestive. They take you out of very, very different and difficult situations. So how rich we are? Who says we are poor? Yes, uh, the material part is not that advanced as it should have been. But the definition of poverty needs to be defined and redefined. It cannot just be associated with material advancement. This is just a one part of poverty. I'm not ignoring Latafat Bay Kasafat Jilva Peda Karnahi Sakti. So I'm I'm not delinking the two. But there is another aspect of the poverty too. Pakistan I was just hearing again Iqbaram Sagal Saab and he was talking about the military and its existence and, and chief of the army stuff. I think it's a very, very important theme in, in current uh, environment. I was speaking uh, to the War Course NDU last Monday and uh, these themes uh, came up. So I feel it's very important that I retreat whatever opinions I have, whatever I believe in and why do I say so? There is a group in this country which feels that our gel, our nucleus, our uh, uh, the, the linkage which brings this federation and society together is a social contract and constitution. And it's widely accepted by intelligentsia, by, by uh, political class, parties, and sometime with strong democratic credentials sometimes, not that strong democratic credentials. Everyone uh, uh, more or less agrees on that. Uh, my opinion is that the social order is even more important and it's sacrosanct than the social contract. Why I say so? Uh, the skeleton 
of this body politic is the social order. If there is no skeleton, what would you flush in? How would you bring the flush? Yes, the aesthetic part, the ostensible part, the, the exhibitionist part is the social contract, is the constitution. But for that, a society has to exist, exist in terms of order. And in order to have that skeleton, that social order, you need a guarantor. And that guarantor cannot be a social contract. Because social contract is the, uh, even if you borrow uh, and, and try to learn the lesson from Magna Carta and post Magna Carta, it gr gradually and slowly grows in a process. The idea of the sovereign, the monarch, and the king was there. And that sovereign was glue to the English society, to the order, for the knights, for the entire aristocratic arrangement of the English society. So in our case, that guarantor, by design or by default, has become Pakistan's military. And the strength of that institution relies on the nucleus of the office of the chief of the army staff. He absolutely rightly identified, you might hate him, I would even go a bit further, or you may love him, that is your problem. You might have right or wrong implications for yourself, for your political career or your social career, but the sacrosanct of, of the social order is so important that according to few uh, conservative historians, and you may not agree with that, but that is what their position is, that it is better to have few centuries of tyranny rather than few weeks of anarchy. So anarchy and chaos they, they are an anathema. It is unacceptable. I was having a conversation with a few uh, learned people and they were advocating, I'm not suggesting at all that we should ignore social contract. We should defy constitution. This is not what I, I am suggesting. What I am suggesting over here that if you guarantee the social order, you evolve towards that social contract, that egalitarian society, that democracy. There are a lot of shortcomings even in the democratic governance system. Even the West has started uh, examining it, criticizing it, and trying to find way out to make it further better. And that's how it is different than any dogmatic idea. Otherwise, we are quite okay with, with the uh, religious dogmas if it has to be stagnant, if, if it has to be uh, treated as a finished product. So it is the death of creativity if we f feel or say or advocate that democracy is the final authority of human thought process. Then we are all mentally dead. Let's, even if it is right, let's challenge it and learn that we are wrong. What is wrong with intellectually uh, flirting with different ideas? We're not marrying them. Flirtation is allowed. So this social order is, is important because what we see, the collapse of this social order, either it is in Syria or in Iraq or in other African uh, uh, weak states where they cannot hold the central authority, this chaos and anarchy, it is worse than anything. I was uh, having a conversation on the lighter note. I told the gentleman, I wouldn't name him because he would be known to so many of you, uh, that we are sitting in this cozy environment in where the air condition is, is uh, providing the balanced temperature to both of us. 
And you're mentioning about the civil unrest and anarchy and chaos and just anticipating it is round the corner. Uh, I told him that, sir, do you realize that when it happened in Iraq, Yazidi women were sold for $50. The reality check would come if, God forbid, my wife or your wife is sold for $100. Then you would know what civil unrest is or what anarchy is, or what chaos is. At that point, I would ask people that what are your choices of social contract or, or the rest of the governance system. It all is ensured when you have the skeleton, the social order, the political order, if it is challenged, if it, it, if it faces, I'm not talking about the state's disintegration, I'm talking about the social disintegration. What happened in Syria? Syria is still a state. They have a president. Afghanistan is a classical state, quite old. All the, uh, uh, my apologies to my Pashtun chauvinistic friends, uh, carries a 5,000 years history and still carrying on as a state, what has happened? The society has become dysfunctional. What happened to Iraq? Iraq is still a state. There is no Kurdistan over there, no conspiracy theories. The American didn't create an Azad Kurdistan, which all our favorite conspiracy theorists would have believed. Nothing happened but it's a dysfunctional society. Functioning on the basis of sect, ethnicity, small little domains of their own, and which is uh, bereft of any betterment of any central authority. But it's, it's a debate uh, that whether you should have governments or not in the future. We should talk about it, that's fine. But it should not apply exclusively to Pakistan. If the 8 billion population, human beings, they decide, oh, we can live without the government, there is no need to have a government. I'm quite okay with it. And there is a stateless and a governmentless global uh, a social order. Fine. If the human being can transform and tra do their transition towards that, who the hell am I as an individual to stand uh, in front of such a lofty goal. But if it has to exclusively be, exclusively be applied to Pakistan, then I do have a problem. <laughs> I wish, I hope, uh, that we develop this ownership. Until and unless we do not own it, and, and to morph and do the transition, uh, uh, bring the transitional democracy to a settled democracy. There are, in my opinion, two ways. One is the pathway of the French Revolution and the other is of the Glorious Revolution. We can choose. One was completely gory and violent and the other was relatively non-violent. If I ever join a political party, I would be doing the advocacy for, for the non-violent one. Who so is suggesting over here that in the civil-military relationship, military should lead, occupy, and dictate each and everything. No one is suggesting that. But it's a marriage in which you have to be a performer. You have to take the role not just through vandalism or agitation or protest. You have to assume that role through governance. Whether somebody likes it or not, it might not be popular on X platform or on Instagram or on Facebook. I may not have that kind of following. Why do I need a government in the first place? I need, I, I contribute my taxes to have a government which can 
provide me security, which can facilitate economic activity, which can ensure the dignity of my, my uh, property and, and ensure my rights. That's why I need a government. I can't do that, uh, uh, perform that role. So I want to have a government. And I assign that role to them. And then we have a social contract. And that social contract codifies that. That, okay, we'll abide by these rules and we have written it. That's what it is. But initially we need to own this, this again I'm referring to social and political order. We have to agree. I've heard saying and arguing people that, oh, Pakistan has not given this to us, so how could you be a loyal citizen? On the one hand, you're talking about the social contract and constitution whose Article 5 says that there has to be unconditional loyalty with the state. So then take out Article 5 from the constitution and bring in that, oh, you can have a conditional loyalty with the state. It is a, a, a prime requisite. You cannot flout, you cannot defy the loyalty part. It has to be there, it is given. I can't say that I would say hello to my dad because he provides me bread. If he doesn't, I'll stop talking to him. Or to my mom. If she provides, if, if I can take the parental analogy, everyone wants that the riyasat to hogi ma ke jaisi. So what do you do with ma? What sort of a status do you assign to mother? Mother is not just a gender. Nature has uh, bestowed it on, on women gender, but it is more of a status. <laughs> It's more of a role. It's more of an adjective. It commands respect. The utmost respect we feel comes from the image of mother. That's why we associate it with our land and we call it mother evatan. We don't call it padar evatan. It's emotional investment. And that investment with, with hedge policy, it, it grows. You protect it. So there is no loss. Unfortunately, we again are facing this, this uh, quite a unique challenge in our uh, society at the moment. And it is not for one political party that I'm trying to target. It has happened with us in the past. Uh, sometime from PMLN, sometime from PPP, sometime from PTI, sometime from JUI, or others. And this has to settle. This has to settle on some basic themes. And the theme is, this is not my phrase that I've coined it, the social order. It's quite a popular one, uh, being, uh, uh, I'm just borrowing it from, from the global intelligentsia. Uh, that has to be sacrosanct. Pakistan has a great story. Pakistan has a great future uh, when it comes to its economy, when it comes to its youth, when it comes to its entrepreneurs, when it comes to its artists, when it comes to its uh, writers. You have produced Sadat Hassan Manto. I mean, what a genius. You have produced Abdullah Madudi. What a contrast. It's an era which is producing Sadat Hassan Manto and Abdullah Madudi. Both the geniuses. You are producing Faz and you are producing Iqbal. What's a, what a juxtaposition. What a diversification. So 
if not everything, almost a lot is here. I wouldn't say everything is here, but a lot is here. So much is here. All we need is to value what we have, to show gratitude for what we have. If you don't have gratitude, in my opinion, you become depressed, you become sick. I, every morning I wait for the person or in the evening who tells me that, oh, today was such a great day. I hardly hear this from people. They are dining in the finest of the restaurants, they are driving luxury cars, they are having the best of the best in their life, but I don't hear this, I don't listen to this. And this, in my opinion, is our lack of, of expressing gratitude. I, I think I should suggest this, that we should utter these words as therapeutic, as a medicine. Shukr alhamdulillah. Great. Very fine. It creates waves. It creates vibes. It turns around people who are dwelling somewhere in the uh, deepest of, of darkness and they bring them out. I have experienced it in my own life, that's why I'm suggesting and saying this. It's been long? <laughs> I, I could see from her looks that if you could just cut it off and, and your sermon is more of becoming like Dr. Zakir Naik or, or rather than a former caretaker prime minister. Uh, thank you, Segal Saab. Thank you, anyone and everyone. Uh, I, I really enjoyed being here. Uh, I've always admired and valued uh, your uh, leadership, your uh, role of being a mentor, and your support towards me as a person, and largely to the society of Pakistan, to the country of Pakistan, you, your family, and everyone. Thank you all.